like to keep this as interactive as possible. So please feel free to interrupt and ask questions. You can unmute yourself at any time. You can use the raise hand or chat features. We will also keep an eye on the live stream YouTube chat. And uh, now let's welcome Nima. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, 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 Nastya and uh, uh, the uh, um, Zooplitudes organizers for uh, putting this together. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, do it. Um, and uh, again, as uh, Nastya said, please feel free to unmute, uh, ask questions as we're going along. Uh, the idea is to try to keep it as uh, interactive uh, as we possibly can. So um, I'm going to be talking about some very basic physics, basic to fundamental physics. Um, uh, the physical processes we'll be talking about are the scattering of elementary particles. Uh, and this physics is deeply tied to the fundamental principles of uh, the laws that we understand govern uh, space-time and quantum mechanics. And over the last 30, 20, 10 years, um, we've been seeing that there is something deeper behind this very basic physics. Uh, uh, there are some uh, remarkable, magical, hidden things behind something as simple as electrons and photons banging into each other, or quarks and gluons, or gravitons banging into each other. Uh, and that has exposed a, a kind of remarkable and very unexpected connection between this very basic physics and some remarkably deep and beautiful uh, new structures in mathematics that have also just been accidentally, so it appears, run into by mathematicians at roughly the same times uh, as we've been seeing them in, in physics. Uh, and so there's been a lot of very interesting activity over the last uh, five, 10 years or so uh, with uh, uh, physicists and mathematicians actually sort of working hand in hand in order to try to more deeply understand uh, what is going on here. So um, that's the sort of broad topic of these uh, lectures. Um, the, uh, the kind of ideas in, in, in mathematics that this very basic physics of space-time and quantum mechanics seems to be related to, and uh, perhaps even uh, these mathematical structures uh, might be hinting at a, deep, at a deeper origin to these uh, fundamental ideas of space-time and quantum mechanics, uh, have to do with various notions that I'm broadly characterizing as uh, the ideas of total positivity or positive geometries and of cluster algebras. And um, anyway, that's what I'll be uh, talking about. Now, I will not be um, giving systematic references um, uh, through these uh, lectures. They're meant to be like summer school lectures, so they're meant to be uh, informal. Um, but I'll be uh, remiss if I didn't at least mention the many wonderful collaborators that I've had uh, in this business. Uh, the work that I'm talking about, the sort of recent, the most recent work um, that, we'll, that we'll get to towards the end of these lectures, um, has been in uh, collaboration over the past couple of years with Song He, uh, Thomas Lamb, Hugh Thomas, Mark Spradlin, uh, work in progress with Julia Salvatore, Hadley Frost, and uh, Pierre-Guy Plamondon, and building on um, uh, recent work also with Yang Tao Bai and Gong Wan Yang. Um, uh, the broad set of ideas uh, uh, going back a decade or so has been, uh, um, uh, I've had really wonderful collaborators uh, that, that have been working on uh, like Yara Trinka, Jake Brzele, Paolo Benincasa, Simone Caron Duo, Cliff Chung, and Jared Kaplan. Uh, the mathematicians Sasha Goncharov and Alex Bosnikov have been amazing uh, collaborators and I've learned enormous amounts from them. And a really special thanks goes to uh, Freddy Cachazo, who taught me everything I know about this subject and has been a wonderful collaborator ever since teaching me. Uh, and also Andrew Hodges, whose amazing, deep, or brilliant ideas are sort of uh, uh, inspired a huge amount of the kind of ideas that I'll be uh, talking about. All right, now this is going to be again like summer school lectures. So I will uh, I will write on the uh, tablet uh, the best we can do for an analog of a blackboard. Uh, um, but I thought I would just begin with slides just to give the uh, uh, to just a set of context and some general motivation for what is uh, for what's uh, going on here. Uh, so uh, we've known for many many years. Um, it really may be going back 50 years, that uh, there's, that because of gravity and quantum mechanics, the notions of space-time have got to eventually break down. Um, we can't give any operational meaning 
to probing distances and times that are comparable to the Planck length, for example, because any attempt to, to do such a probing produces a black hole instead that uh, makes it impossible to sort of probe what, what we're trying to see. And um, relatedly, and maybe more deeply, it was already appreciated in the 1960s, uh, at least whether people thought about it deeply, that when you have gravity and quantum mechanics, at least the only obvious quantum mechanical observables that you can talk about are anchored to the boundary of space-time. And, not, uh, and, can't, and so you can't make any very precise, arbitrarily, infinitely precise um, uh, measurements or observations, uh, can't talk about observables, in the interior of space-time because of the inevitable fluctuations associated with, uh, with both uh, gravity and quantum mechanics. And so a little over 20 years ago, we have this amazing uh, correspondence that gives us the first very concrete idea for how we can see the ideas of space emerging from more primitive ingredients um, in the context of empty to sitter space. So we imagine the, uh, if we imagine that the world is the inside of an empty to sitter space in can, then the kind of observables that we're allowed to talk about on the boundary or to ping things on the boundary of this tin can, send excitations into the interior that bang into each other and come back out in some way. So the kind of observations we're allowed to talk about are measurements that are done uh, on the walls of this tin can. Uh, and uh, a little over 20 years ago, um, uh, we started to understand and people are understanding more and more, it's an, an, an incredible thing that uh, in fact, uh, the entire inside of the tin can is sort of a hologram. That uh, there's a fundamentally quantum mechanical theory that just lives on the walls of this tin can, and natural quantum mechanical questions on the walls of the tin can actually give you the answers that we normally ascribe to the things propagating in, into the middle, banging to each other, and coming back out. So this gives us our sort of first example, in this case, of the ideas of some kind of quantum mechanical theory being more fundamental and space emerging from it, from the sort of strong dynamics of this theory, perhaps from the entanglement patterns associated with the, uh, with the, uh, with the strong interactions of these quantum mechanical systems and so on. Very important thing in this picture is that time is left alone. Time does not emerge. Space emerges, but time emerges for the simple reason that the time that flows in the interior of the tin can is the same as the time that flows on the outside. So, uh, so this is an, an equivalent between two physical systems that have ordinary words to describe them. Okay, they're both ordinary quantum mechanical systems. We have a precise description of it on the boundary with a notion of evolution in time, from the infinite past to the infinite future. Okay, so there's an enormous amount still to understand about this, of course, and it's the most active area of research in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, fundamental theoretical physics. Um, but eventually we have to get closer to the real world. Um, the world is not the inside of a tin can. Um, uh, most importantly, uh, the world is cosmological. There's some initial Big Bang singularity perhaps. Um, it evolves in time. Uh, it's not the static, infinitely old uh, tin can. And uh, of course, it's also not negatively curved like the inside of empty to sitter space. So one significant step closer to the real world is to imagine just flat space time or asymptotically flat space time. Um, and uh, there, the analog of this observable at infinity are scattering amplitudes. So you're, you get to throw things in from infinity, they bang into each other and they go back out to uh, infinity. So the observable is the, uh, is, are, are the scattering amplitudes or the S matrix. Uh, now, that's, the flat space is still not the real world. The real world is cosmological. And again, the analog of this sort of observation we can do uh, at infinity, what the meaningful quantum mechanical observations that we can do at infinity are associated with the pretentiously named weight function of the universe, uh, which are measurements we can make at late time. So we can talk about spatial averages, spatial correlations at a late time surface. Um, and uh, so, uh, so these are the kind of, of observables we're allowed to uh, talk about. But there's a, there's a very important difference between these situations and what we're used to uh, in the world of the tin can picture, uh, which is that here, once you're in this holographic mindset, then if you go to the boundary, the boundary is a normal place. The boundary of empty to space is a normal place. It has a notion of time. It has a notion of locality, of metrics. So once you uh, very importantly get in this frame of mind, it's reasonable to say that what should live on the walls that, that give the holographic theory is just an ordinary quantum field theory. The difficulty when we 
try to get closer to the real world in these cases of asymptotically flat space or empty disintegrated space is that there's no obvious notion of either locality or time on the boundary uh, in these cases. For example, the most obvious geometric notion of the boundary in flat space would be what you see around you. Okay? So what you see around you is the celestial sphere. And so you can imagine that there is some theory that lives on the celestial sphere. Uh, but the, the difficulty is there's no obvious notion of locality on the celestial sphere. In fact, sort of particles would come in poking in from the celestial sphere at infinity, and they sort of magically at infinite time go out at very different points. There's no obvious notion of locality. There's no very uh, standard notion of time. Um, and so we don't know what to do there. Uh, I'm going to come back to this uh, point uh, a number of times. Uh, we're going to talk about what our canvas is, the, the place where we have to live in order to find the theory. Um, and uh, that'll make it clear what the sort of challenge is. Um, uh, anyway, there's an analogous problem even worse when we talk about cosmology. There, there the, the sort of place where the, the observation lives doesn't even have a time. It's just spatial, nothing else. So uh, I think, and this is a speculation, but it's a speculation that certainly guided my own thinking for the past decade, that it's likely that we might need to see something even more radical. Not that quantum mechanics is king and space emerges from it, which, are, which of course we've seen in the context of the gauge gravity correspondence, but that we have to see some other ideas, some question mark, some, some more abstract uh, ideas and principles out of which quantum mechanics and not just space, but space-time will actually both emerge. And will emerge in a way where they're sort of tied together, uh, inseparable, hand in hand. Um, we're going to see examples of this phenomenon very concretely. This is all very airy, fairy and, and uh, philosophical right now, but we're going to see uh, uh, baby examples of this phenomenon quite concretely in these uh, lectures. So uh, let me uh, put you on the frame of mind that we're going to be in for the rest of these uh, lectures. So let's imagine now we're going to talk about the physics of uh, scattering processes. So imagine, uh, imagine that uh, you're an experimentalist. Um, you throw some particles in from infinity. They bang into each other. They go back out to infinity. And you don't know what happened inside. You know, an experimentalist that collides two protons, they don't ride with the protons inside to see the quarks banging into each other. And then this banged into that. And all, all this other stuff happens. And, and then things come back out. All they see is that things get thrown in from infinity and they go back out to infinity. And they want to know what made that happen. What made the scattering process happen? What, uh, what, uh, what are the rules, what are the principles that give rise to these uh, amplitudes that I sort of mod squared to get the probabilities for all the processes happening? And as theorists, we give an answer. We say that what goes in this question mark, what goes in this question mark is some picture like this, where the particles bang into each other, then this hits that, and so on. These pictures take place in the interior of space and time that the experimentalist doesn't see. They're just living at in infinity. Okay? But these pictures, all this stuff happens in the interior of space and time. And we add up every way that all these things can happen in order to be compatible with the principles of quantum mechanics. So it's really local unitary evolution in space, time, and Hilbert space that, uh, that's the conventional answer to this question. And actually, one of the beautiful things is that in many cases, not, not, not in complete generality, uh, but in many cases, we understand well enough what these principles of local and unitary evolution, uh, actually how they're reflected in these amplitudes that are measured in infinity. So they're reflected, broadly speaking, in certain, uh, in some singularity properties that these amplitudes have. And so, in a sense, you can say that that's the sort of uh, fundamental properties that these objects have to have. Uh, that's that's uh, um, uh, that's the uh, those are the properties that sort of that that encode it. Uh, these processes are taking place in space time and being compatible with quantum mechanics. And this picture of particles propagating in the middle and banging into each other and so on is a way of making this manifest. Okay, so, so, so uh, by the way, here, there, there's, there's a question. Uh, this, uh, this bell here is, is meant to be, at the moment, kind of a loose statement. It looks like boundary. It can look like derivative. Uh, here, it's just saying that the sort of singularities of an amplitude, um, for example, uh, and we'll come back to this at, at great length, the, the, the singularities of, of an amplitude take place when, for example, an intermediate virtual particle becomes real 
uh, and there the amplitude develops a pole, and, and on the residue of the pole, we get the product of two lower amplitudes. So that fact, it, uh, that, that, that fact is reflecting something about local interactions in space-time. The only way to get a pole is when a particle propagates over a long distance in space-time, and that, uh, uh, and, uh, but is produced by some local interaction here, propagates a long way, and sort of decays out on the uh, other side. So the conventional picture is, uh, is a local unitary evolution in space-time. But as we've seen over the past, as I said, 30, 20, 10 years, the actual answer, the structure of the answer is so remarkable, has so many magical hidden properties that it's becoming increasingly clear that in fact, it's the, it's the answer also to a different question. In other words, there's a different kind of question, uh, perhaps formulated directly in the kinematical space, directly in the space of the, of the, of the energies and the momenta of the particles that knows nothing about the interior of the space time. Um, there's another kind of question that we have to find whose answer will end up producing these uh, properties uh, uh, as, a, as a consequence of something else, as a derivative consequence of something else. And if we can find that, then uh, we'll start perhaps getting a, the beginning of a clue for how the rules of space-time and quantum mechanics, locality and unitarity, can actually emerge as derivative concepts. And so that's, uh, that's our basic philosophy here. We're looking for a new question. Um, we have one possible answer. We know that one thing that can give rise to these scattering processes, we're not doing any speculative physics here. We're just talking about good old fashioned theories that describe the world, gauge theories, scalar field theories. Um, uh, so we don't have, uh, we're not speculating about something new, but we're trying to see whether we can think about conventional physics that so crucially relies on space time and quantum mechanics in a completely different way where we can see that uh, there are other ideas and principles at work and that the rules of space-time and quantum mechanics come out as derivative concepts. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our broad, broad philosophy here. Now, that's been a lot of philosophy, but I just want to transition for a second to the sort of practical evidence that there's something like this uh, going on. And that's one of the joys of this subject is that, uh, is that there are both these sort of large, vague philosophical reasons uh, to be looking for structures and ideas like this, an extremely concrete, practical, uh, 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 theoretical data, and even practically relevant calculations for experiment that suggest the same thing. So let's come back uh, down to Earth, literally, and think about collisions at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, now, uh, probably many, uh, almost all of you know that, that, that we collide protons at the Large Hadron Collider at incredibly uh, high energies, uh, Velocity is 0.999, 9999, that's 7.9, the speed of light, in order to probe distances a thousand times smaller than the atomic nucleus. And uh, here's a very broad brush uh, uh, cartoon is um, that uh, uh, when, you, when you collide particles at the LHE, there's maybe about a billion collisions every second. And ordinary physics, even physics that was like major discovery in the mid 90s, the production of the heaviest elementary particle we know, the top core, where 14 of them were made by uh, the Fermilab accelerator outside uh, Chicago uh, in the mid 90s when it was discovered. Well, the LHC makes 10 of them every second. Uh, we might be looking for a new physics, for example, supersymmetry or something. If we're very lucky, we'd be making those particles maybe once a minute or once an hour. Well, so far, never. Okay, so, but that gives you an idea of uh, the magnitude of the challenge uh, that our experimental friends have. You have to be able to understand the, the, the rates for completely ordinary physics at incredibly high accuracy in order to be able to subtract them out and uh, look for little bumps over this enormous, enormous background. So for example, you need to know what happens that some of the, the, the uh, there are quarks inside the proton, they're held together with gluons. And for example, when we collide uh, protons, there's a process where two gluons hit each other in and four gluons go out. So you have to know how to calculate this. Well, in principle, we know how to do these calculations. As I said, there's no new physics here. This is a picture that we got from, from uh, Feynman and friends uh, uh, over 60 years ago. And what we're supposed to do is imagine every possible way this process happens uh, and uh, draw these little uh, space-time pictures for them with precise uh, rules for uh, what, this, what happens at each one of these uh, interaction vertices. 
each one of these pictures is supposed to correspond to some particular process in space time, and we're supposed to add all of them up in order to be compatible with quantum mechanics and find this picture for how to think about quantum mechanics and sort of summing over all the possible, uh, possible histories in which some possible process could have taken place. And even if we restrict uh, to the simplest possible processes, uh, these are the so-called tree processes where there's no e even e uh, internal loops in them, uh, these turn out to be the leading, uh, uh, give us the leading answer for these, uh, uh, for these processes. Well, there's lots of them. Okay, there's lots and lots of them. There's an, ex there's an explosion in both the number of diagrams and the number of terms. And this is what the, the actual answer looks like from a brute force calculation. If you just open up the textbook and copy out the rules, you get hundreds of pages of horrible algebra. And it's not illuminating at all. And you, know, you might think that's just the answer. There's no guarantee that every question has a simple answer. This looks like a complicated question. Two things in, four things out, it looks very complicated. Um, uh, but physics is a wonderful way of rewarding morally good behavior. And a little over 30 years ago, the people who actually had to do this calculation because it was relevant for experiments, discovered an astonishing thing that uh, I want to explain this notation. Those of you who know, know. Those of you who don't, uh, won't help to explain it. But, um, but it turns out that, uh, that the amplitude, for example, for some very simple cases, uh, let's say when all the helicities of the gluons, so the gluons have spin, they have a spin in the direction they move. If all the helicities are the same, or all but one are the same, the amplitude is actually zero. And if two of them have one helicity, let's say negative helicity, and the other ones have positive helicity, these hundreds and hundreds of pages of algebra collapse to a single line, a single term even. Um, so this is absolutely amazing. Uh, back then it was not recognized uh, immediately as a sort of tip of an enormous iceberg. Today we know it's the tip of an enormous iceberg. And it makes it clear that Feynman's way of doing this physics, which is the whole point of which is to make the usual rules of space time and quantum mechanics as manifest as possible, is correct, is obviously correct. But it's also obviously hiding something, that there are some other structures, some other ideas that would immediately give us this answer. And maybe if we knew what those structures and ideas are, we could reverse engineer it and understand why they could also be represented in Feynman's way that makes space time and quantum mechanics obvious. Okay, so, so you see, we've gone from this airy fairy philosophy down to something very specific, um, where we, we try to understand where the hidden simplicity um, in these uh, uh, remarkable, uh, uh, in these fascinating objects comes from, um, and, uh, and uh, try to understand what principles gives rise to these incredibly simple expressions. Uh, and, and understand other symmetries. We'll come to some of those things in, in, in a moment. Um, and uh, hopefully not just learn how to calculate them instead of going through thousands of pages of algebra, but also understand what the new principles and ideas are behind them um, in, in order to uh, perhaps get uh, uh, the beginning of a sense for where the rules of space-time and quantum mechanics might come from more primitively. Okay. So in fact, it's not, in this case of the scattering of gluons, it's not just that um, the answer is extremely simple, that a thousand pages boils down to a, a single term. Um, it's that the answer, it turns out, uh, um, people recognize around 15 years ago, it turns out to have an amazing hidden symmetry. Um, so uh, I can illustrate the uh, symmetry. If you think about the gluons as, as carrying momenta, P1, P2, up to P6 in this example. These are, uh, these are four-dimensional uh, space-time momenta, energies of momenta. A momentum conservation tells you that the momenta of all these particles add up to zero. Um, and so I can represent the momenta on this sort of a, in, in this sort of four-dimensional polygon. So here is momentum P1, P2, P3. So you see all the momenta add up to zero. That just tells you that you have this uh, closed polygon. All right, so that's just the representation for what the sort of data of the scattering process looks like, what these momenta look like. But the remarkable observation is that the amplitudes have a, uh, have a symmetry under reflecting these coordinates, the coordinates in this funny space, uh, which have units of uh, momenta, okay? So the, the vertices of this polygon. And that's a hidden symmetry. You don't see it. Any given Feynman diagram doesn't see that symmetry at all. It's just the property of the full answer. And in fact, that symmetry, uh, suitably elevated, uh, is known as dual conformal invariance. And, uh, and, and the, when you 
further extend it. That, that's true at the leading level, the tree level of interactions that's true for ordinary gluons. If we talk also, if we also include loops, there's the uh, supersymmetric cousin of the theory of gluons, the maximally supersymmetric cousin of the theory of gluons. And this symmetry and the ordinary symmetries combine into this fancy, amazing, infinite symmetry known as the Yangian, uh, technically the Yangian of SL4 slash 4. But I want to stress that this is a symmetry that could have been, in principle, people knew where to look. It could have been seen in 1955, but it was not seen until the late 2000, uh, until, the, until late in the last uh, decade. Um, and this is not some fancy schmancy esoteric thing. It lo might look like a fancy schmancy esoteric thing, but in fact, this symmetry contains, uh, contains in it and gives a relativistic generalization of an ancient symmetry that explains why planetary orbits are ellipses. So you know if you solve the Kepler problem that it's a little bit of a miracle that you can analytically solve it and, for example, find that the orbits are ellipses. And that's because uh, there's a hidden symmetry associated with the running lens vector. Uh, and that symmetry is, in fact, relativistically generalized and contained in this, uh, in this uh, uh, Yangian symmetry for this, uh, for this problem. Okay, so, um, so, what, so that's, the, that's the broad uh, context. So um, what we're, going to be, uh, we're going to be looking for a question in all of these, in all these lectures. Um, we want to find some question mark. What question can we ask? In, on, in the canvas, in the space uh, of that, that labels the, the scattering process. Um, so directly in the space where the scattering process lives. No intermediate space time, no virtual particles. That's the sort of physical idea here. We wanna get rid of all of these ideas like virtual particles, only talk about the actual scattering states that you sort of measure at the infinity. Uh, and, and for the past 10 years and really more, more intensely in the last two years or so, we're seeing the nature uh, at least one nature of an answer to this, uh, uh, one nature of the question that could go on this question mark that involves these notions that I'll be talking about of, uh, of, of very primitive basic combinatorial ideas, geometric ideas associated with this word positive geometries, all of which live in the kinematic space of the uh, scattering process. Okay, so um, now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this canvas in uh, detail, but uh, so this is, this is where the amplitudes live. So where, where are the various canvases? So for example, we could just talk about the physical momenta of the particle. Let's say we have massless particles. We could talk about a, a n massless particle scattering. I just have the n, I just have n null momenta. Okay, so that's the, that's the space where the amplitudes live. Um, uh, uh, as we said, we could talk about the celestial sphere. We could talk about twisted variables. Um, if we're talking about cosmology, we're talking about the spatial future. I won't be talking about cosmology in these lectures, but all of these things are just different ways with different emphases of talking about the space directly where the amplitudes live. Okay? Either physical momenta, twister, the celestial sphere, they're all just different ways of thinking broadly of the sort of boundary of Minkowski space the, that, uh, that, that, that labels the actual asymptotic states that participate in the scattering process. And so that's our challenge. So that's the space. Unlike an anti space where it's a normal place, the boundaries are a normal place with a notion of a metric and time and locality and so on. Not so here. So what ideas of breathe physics life into the space? That's, that's the question we're going to be asking. So given this sort of canvas, what kind of question can we ask? And again, uh, we're going to see in this, really in this kinematical space, um, the emerging picture is that there are combinatorial ideas uh, associated with these ideas of positive geometry, uh, canonical forms, all of these things we'll talk about in more detail. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so far, they have been relevant for uh, questions of gluon scattering um, uh, and, uh, and its maximally supersymmetric extension. That's the story of the amphosahedron. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, we've seen that, 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 that essentially uh, philosophically identical ideas now show up in completely non-supersymmetric theories, no hint of any kind of, uh, of the standard magic that we might blame these things on, like supersymmetry or integrability. Or the, these are just seemingly totally boring theories, just scalar field theories. Um, but there are these ideas that go along with them. There are, in fact, hidden symmetries associated with them. 
uh, which are exposed by these uh, geometries. We'll be talking about that quite a bit. That's associated with these ideas of associahedra, uh, cluster algebra, polytopes, and so on. And in the uh, context of cosmology, very baby steps in this direction have been taken um, uh, with the ideas of uh, uh, things that are called uh, cosmological polytopes. Uh, but I want to stress that all of this stuff describes the real world in some reasonable approximation. So this is not some esoteric uh, that is nothing, you know, that maybe you can imagine in 10 steps would have something to do with the real world. All of these in some approximation actually describe the real world. And, uh, and to me, the sort of delight and magic of this subject is exactly that, that there are hidden symmetries, remarkable new mathematical structures, um, uh, and a huge magic that's uh, sitting there in ordinary physics, just right there under our, our noses. Um, and uh, so that's what I want to be uh, telling you about more hey, today. Sorry, um, so just a quick question. Uh, yeah. Does the symmetry also rise in presence of masses or are you always in the massless case? Uh, well, in the story of the scalar field theory, it could be massive as well. Mass is not is not a big deal in that case. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that it's massless, but in the scalar case, you can add a mass without a problem. Thanks. All right. I'm sorry, okay. and so, I... Yes. Uh, excuse me. A naive question. So here you you're talking about uh, the, uh, the the particles which had uh, uh, a definitive momenta. So how about like can uh, which are totally unlocalized? Can we? I mean, uh, I'm wondering if this hidden symmetry is, is possible for for like uh, like uh, structure with localized like forms. Uh, when we expand things, well, you, you can you can ask whether whether things like this show up for things other than scattering amplitudes, correlation functions, form factors, and so on. And yeah, there are some there are some evidence that that uh, that some of these structures extend. Um, but uh, uh, but for various reasons, I'll just be focusing on the scattering processes today. I mean, I think that the scattering processes have a special place. A, they're the most basic observable of fundamental physics, even experimentally. And B, they have this privileged status, at least in asymptotically flat space, as being the interesting observable that we can uh, talk about. Uh, of course, there's many other things that we could talk about as well, but I'll just, we'll, we'll have our hands full just, just, just with these. Uh, any other questions? So I, 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 I have one. Uh, you, you mentioned the locality and the unitarity. While uh, unitarity is, is, is obvious, what does it mean? But but what do you mean by by by, by locality in, in this in this sense? An excellent question. Why is it crucial? That, 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 well, um, first, it's obviously it's obviously approximately true in the real world at the very least. Um, there are sort of reasons, maybe to do with gravity, ultimately that there is something slightly funny about it. But uh, there is something uh, at zeroth order. Physics is local, uh, for sure. Um, and uh, uh, and that's in fact the sort of challenge because we're trying to figure out when you do this experiment, when you bang, throw things in from infinity and they, they bang into each and they go back out to infinity, you weren't there. There's no one in the middle to know that what happened was local interactions in space time. Uh, the, the challenge is to figure out what property of the answer encodes that. And, um, and uh, that's a difficult question that we don't actually know the answer to a priori. Uh, that was, uh, if you like, that was the S matrix program of the 1960s was the hope to find an a priori answer to that question. And in particular, an a priori answer to the uh, answer to what causality meant. Um, so again, you don't know that things happen step by step in a causal way in the middle. You're just sitting there at the infinity. Um, and yet, uh, there's something about the analytic properties of the amplitude that encodes causality. We don't yet a priori know what. And the F matrix program largely failed because they couldn't figure out a priori what those constraints were. But in a sense, our attitude here is exactly the opposite. We're no longer sort of imagining we're responsibly putting on our Boy Scout caps and trying to figure out what causality and locality mean at the level of the amplitudes. We're looking for a totally different kind of question, totally different kind of natural question that will spit out an answer that has the properties that we can begin to identify as what we think of as local local physics. So that's what's uh, that's what's nice about this uh, this uh, problem. On the one hand, uh, we're just talking about completely established physics. It's actually rigorously local, but on the other hand, we're trying to figure out how to think about it in a way where, uh, at first, the teams were tying our hands behind our back and we're refusing to talk about local interactions in space time. Doing that is going to expose all sorts of new structures 
uh, from which we can begin to read out backwards how uh, the usual goals of local space-time and, and, uh, and a unitary evolution come out. And this all sounds sort of abstract right now if you haven't seen this kind of thing before, but, but I promise we'll be seeing very concrete examples of this in, this, uh, in these uh, lectures. Okay. All right, so um, the, a final comment before I switch to the whiteboard uh, is that uh, uh, just in the past couple of years, there's been, uh, a, 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 to me, a surprising convergence of ideas between different threads of the subject, between n equals four super young mills, amplitudes on the one hand, just the scattering amplitudes of very simple scalar field theories, we'll talk about them more, the phi cubed by a joint theories on the other hand, as well as amplitudes in string theory. Uh, and all of these ideas are sort of chopping around in an essentially identical mathematical territory um, uh, related to the things that were in the title of these, uh, of, of these lectures, uh, positive geometry and cluster algebra. All right, so, um, so let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, could be some uh, symmetries of the theory uh, be understood uh, from the uh, conformal bootstrap approach? Um, uh, I can just, uh, I mean, I don't know what will happen in the future, uh, but, uh, but uh, not so far. I mean, there, there, uh, as, when, when you see the kind of things that makes them manifest, you'll you'll get a uh, you'll get a better idea for uh, for uh, what they're like and why it's sort of not likely that we that we'll see them from ordinary uh, from from ordinary local ways of thinking about about this. Okay, so um, all right, so I, I now want to talk about I now want to talk about the canvas in a little more detail, um, and first. Uh, let's just talk about, um, you know, the most obvious thing, if we have n particles scattering, one, two, up to n, let's say they're all massless, <clears throat> so we have p mu with p mu squared equals zero. <clears throat> now, uh, there's, a, there's a famous way, and I won't be using this a lot in these lectures, so I won't explain it in detail if you, if, if you, if you haven't seen it, but there's a standard way of grouping momenta into a two by two matrix. <clears throat> and so P squared equals zero means that the determinant of this uh, matrix is zero. And that means that I can write this uh, uh, two by two matrix as the outer product of two two dimensional vectors. And these are known as spinner helicity variables. So, um, so, we could spend a, a, a long time talking about these things, but uh, all I want you to see uh, from here is that uh, the first candidate for what the canvas is, sorry, the first candidate is that is I just have a bunch of momenta, null momenta, P1 to Pn, and I can translate them to uh, a, a, a spinner helicity variable, two two-dimensional vectors for particle one up to particle n. Okay, so challenge number one is, uh, is how do we understand, uh, this is our space. The, so the amplitude is a function of these variables. And now we want to ask, uh, in this space, what question can we ask? What question to ask in the space of n two vectors, lambda and n two vectors, lambda tilde, uh, whose answer gives me an amplitude? See, it's not so obvious what to do. Now, uh, in the study of the scattering amplitude for gluons um, and its maximally supersymmetric extension, there's another set of variables. I won't actually describe what they are in, in detail, uh, but they're slightly simpler. They're known as momentum twister variables. And they're just very simply algebraically related to the other guys. Okay, but I'm just giving you a survey of the kind of uh, canvas. Okay? So, this is now, for each variable, we have a four vector, z1, z2, up to zn. Okay, so here's a four vector. So that, that kind of makes sense. There's a four momenta for each particle. Uh, there's, there's naively four degrees of freedom for each particle. So here's the n four vectors. In fact, you know there aren't really four degrees of freedom, there's three, because each p squared is equal to zero. 
And so there's an actually that, uh, that, that going from four to three is reflected here in an action that of ZA under rescaling. Okay, so at zero order, we're supposed to actually identify uh, these things in slightly more detail. The amplitudes have a particular homogeneity under this, uh, uh, they have a particular homogeneity under this rescaling. Okay, but once again, uh, I seem to have N, th this is my canvas. I have N four momenta. What am I supposed to do with, in the space of N four momenta? Uh, sorry, uh, in the space of N four vectors, what kind of question can I ask whose answer has all the richness and complexity of a scattering amplitude? Um, now, actually, in the context of uh, the scattering of gluons, we have a little bit more. The gluons uh, have a color. So the, here are the gluons. They also have a color index. So really, when I have the scattering of n of these guys, I have n color indices, a1 up to an. And there's a conventional way of, uh, of uh, keeping track of the of the colors um, by writing, but, but keeping a dependence on the colors by uh, pulling out factors of traces of the of of uh, generators. Let's say for SUN, if we're talking about uh, uh, gluon scattering in, in in SUN gauge theory. Okay, so we'd have we'd have a factor that looks like trace TA1 through TAN times an amplitude that now just depends. All the color is gone. It just depends on the momenta P1 up to Tn, and now I could order these color labels differently if I like, okay? So in general, I would have a sum over all the permutations. I have a sum over all the permutations, a sigma one up to a sigma n. Actually, because the trace is cyclically invariant, it's not all the permutations, it's the permutations uh, uh, up to cyclic shift of, of of a more primitive object that doesn't have color anymore, only depends on these momenta and also depends on these uh, permutations. Okay, so now I have something slightly simpler. I have an amplitude that has an ordering in it, one, two up to n. And it's in fact that ordering, which is uh, useful to write the amplitude now as a function of these n momentum twisted variables. Okay, so in other words, it is not just that I have n four vectors, I have n four vectors. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. I have n four vectors with an ordering, with a natural ordering, z1 through zn. Okay. And in fact, that ordering uh, is all that it takes in order to start being able to find some uh, some structure. Uh, and a question in the space of, of n four vectors with an ordering uh, to be able to uh, find a question whose answer is all the richness and complexity of the uh, amplitude. And this is a story of the amplitohedron or uh, the more recent understanding of the amp amplitohedron in kinematic space. And uh, if, if you don't know about this, just the let the words wash over you for just uh, three minutes or so. But, uh, but, uh, but since this is a sort of first instantiation of some of these ideas, I want to uh, mention it. See, when you have an ordering, uh, it turns out that in these spaces, you can, ask, uh, you can ask interesting questions, that there's interesting positive parts. There's an interesting positive part to the space of n uh, four vectors. What I mean by positive part is some configuration of these four of these four vectors that are real, but where the determinant, the symbol with a bracket here means determinant, the determinant of ZA1, ZA2, ZA3, ZA4 uh, is always positive or greater than or equal to zero. Now the determinant matters because the space-time symmetries, which in, in this case just turn into it turns out just an SL4 symmetry, four by four linear transformations acting on the Zs. Okay? So the space-time symmetry means that the only invariants we can talk about are determinants. Uh, and so in the space of the n variables, there's a natural positive part. And within that positive part, there's a, uh, so, so, so here's our kinematic space. So here's our, here's our kinematic space. It's a space of n Zs, Z1 through Zn. 
there is this natural positive part to this space. And there are some extensions of this notion of uh, positivity that I don't have, uh, I won't have time to talk about um, in detail, but there's a notion of positivity with a certain kind of topological winding associated with it as well. Okay, so, uh, so there are some, uh, there are some, there are some, there are some positive winding regions. And, uh, okay, so that's it. So in this kinematic space, there's an interesting region. Um, what does that have to do with the amplitude? Well, the amplitude turns out to be thought of uh, not as a function, but the amplitude turns out to be thought of as a differential form of lower degree. So, uh, so this space is 4n dimensional. Um, it's of lower degree in this uh, in this space. Uh, let me call it uh, a little. Uh, it actually turns out to be four little k if you know what these things mean, but it doesn't matter if you don't. So there's a lower differential form in this space, and um, what determines this differential form? So what's the question we get to ask in this space? There's this interesting positive part. We had an ordering, and we could say the word positivity, but now we have to figure out something that determines this uh, form, and the answer turns out to be that that there are certain subspaces of this dimensionality, 4K dimensional subspaces, and these subspaces intersect this positive part in an interesting shape. So they intersect in a shape that we call a positive geometry. And in this case, the positive geometry is actually the amphitohedron. So I remind you, we are sort of beginning with nothing. We're beginning with the space of n four momenta, uh, n uh, four dimensional vectors with an ordering. There's a positive, there's a notion of positivity that's made possible by that. And continuing and following that up, it becomes possible to discover an interesting sort of geometric region, kind of a, a, a generalization of the interior of a polygon um, uh, in, in, in in these uh, slightly more interesting spaces. And um, what determines the amplitude, what actually determines the amplitude is that the amplitude is this differential form. Um, the amplitude is this form that has singularities on and only on the boundaries of this region. So we're going to talk about this notion at, uh, at, at, some, at some length of the amphitohedron. Okay, but that's the, that's, the, that's the first idea here, is that, um, is that in the kinematical space, you find some interesting positive region, some interesting subspaces. The intersection of the subspaces of the positive regions gives you some geometry. And that geometry, in turn, forces the existence of a certain differential form. That form is a slave to the geometry. It has singularities on and only on all the boundaries of the space. All right? Uh, so, me, my, now, now that, I, that's your, yes. Can I ask you a question, or I can wait for later? Um, I, I got confused about the definition of positive winding. I, I didn't give it. I did not give one. So, so that uh, it would take too long to uh, to explain that uh, uh, right now. Um, I will say that we'll we'll probably if if we get there, we'll come back to the story of n equals four uh, super Yang Mills uh, and and these notions uh, uh, maybe in the very last lecture. Um, but I wanted to say this is an example where we understand at least at some level things not just at tree level but to all loop order uh, at the level of the so-called integrand of the scattering amplitude. It's a much fancier example than the one that we're going to be talking about in the rest of these lectures, ironically. Um, but uh, but I, I wanted to mention it as a, as a, as a known example where these things work. Um, uh, and we can, uh, there's still a lot to understand about how they work, but, but where they know uh, how they work. So, uh, but that's the sort of first canvas. And the theory of gluons, the, 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 the canvas are these uh, spinner helicity variables, these lambdas and lambda tildes, or we can translate them to the space of n four vectors. Uh, and once again, 
in this space, we have to find a question, somehow find an interesting mathematical question whose answer is going to give us the scattering amplitude. And uh, what we've seen in the spur of the amplihedron is that that involves finding in the kinematic space a notion of positivity um, and uh, a certain geometry associated with that positivity. And the amplitudes are, uh, remember, an important aspect of amplitudes is where their poles are, where their singularities are. And somehow, where their singularities are, are, are controlled uh, a priori by a totally different geometric object. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, the knowledge of that geometric object completely fixes what the, uh, what the amplitude can be. And it tells you that it has, uh, uh, it tells you where the singularities are. And you can really begin to read out from the existence of this object. You can read backwards uh, where the singularities come from uh, and interpret them as uh, local and unitary processes in space time. All right, so that's the story of the amphitheatron. And now we're going to go back and uh, now we're going to uh, talk about a second uh, set of theories um, where everything is a lot easier. So uh, um, if you, as I said, if you, uh, if you didn't know anything about what I just uh, said for the past five, seven minutes, you can just ignore it. And we're just going to start, uh, we're going to start um, afresh. Uh, so here's a second set of theories. Okay, so, so the, the canvas part two. Uh, for uh, theories that are known as uh, the biadjoint scalar field theories. The BA there stands for biadjoint. And let me just um, uh, immediately talk about uh, just practically what, what these are. So uh, uh, these are scalars, so there's no polarizations or helicity or anything like that. They're just scalars. And, uh, and the Feynman diagrams are just what you get if you imagine ordering one, uh, if you have an ordering for the external legs, like one, two, three, four, and you just draw a planar diagram. Okay, so I would have, for example, for four point scattering, I'd have these two things. So the amplitude would be one over S plus one over T, but I would not have the U channel, the other diagram, one, two, three, four. I don't have that because that's not, uh, uh, because uh, that's not planar in this ordering, one, in this ordering, one, one, two, three, four, okay? Um, okay, so um, now, uh, so uh, what's, what's the, the, the reason for this name by a joint scalar theory? Well, um, if you wanted to guess something like this uh, color ordering that we're familiar with for gluons for the scalar theory, you might imagine that you'd have a, a theory of scalars and maybe it has some color index like we have for gluons and you'd write down an interaction that looks like this, FABC, but this vanishes uh, because the FABCs are anti-symmetric. Um, so what you need to do is also imagine that they have another color index with another FABC. Okay, and, and that's it. So that's the theory that we're uh, talking about. And if you take this theory and you calculate the amplitudes with it, then just as we stripped off one color factor before, trace TA1 through TAN, we can also strip off uh, another one of the color factors, T capital A1 through T capital AN. And the thing that we're left with depends on, in fact, in principle, there is one permutation that I could have here, sigma, there's another permutation, I don't know, alpha that I could have on this side. And so, the amplitude depends on two permutations, alpha one through alpha n, and uh, also sigma one through sigma n, depending on which, uh, uh, depending on uh, the color orderings for one color factor and another color factor. And the Feynman diagrams are extremely simple. They're just all the diagrams that are planar with respect to both orderings, both the alpha ordering and the sigma ordering. Uh, so. For simplicity, I'm going to focus on the cases where the orderings are the same. Um, so, and therefore, I'm just going to write that as just m12 up to n, and uh, since the orderings are the same. And this just gives us an excuse to sum planar cubic Feynman diagrams. Okay, so that's the theory that we're talking about. All right, so, okay, so uh, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's keep, keep going with this, uh, 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 with this K 
kinematical canvas. How do I think about the uh, how do I think about the variables that show up in these in these amplitudes? Um, so let's say I, I do this example again. Uh, so here the variable that I see is um, is a propagator. The S channel propagator would be P1 plus P2 squared. Okay. Uh, in this T channel, um, the variable that I see would be P2 plus P3 squared. And let's say I do a more complicated example. One, two, three, four, five. So here I would have P1 plus P2 squared. And here I'd have, uh, for example, P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared in that propagator. And you'll notice, of course, it's slightly annoying. I could also write this by momentum conservation as P4 plus P5 squared. Okay, so the variables, uh, uh, but you'll notice that in all these cases, the variables that show up, uh, the variables that show up in, in these, uh, in, the, uh, in the amplitude associated with the Feynman diagrams are just sums of consecutive momenta. So I could have like PA plus uh, PA plus one plus dot dot plus PB squared. Okay, so these are the kind of variables uh, that uh, show up. And so the amplitude only depends on these invariant quantities. Now we know ahead of time more generally that, uh, that the amplitudes will only depend, since there's no spin or polarization, the amplitudes will only depend on these dot products of momenta, PI dot PJ. Okay, so these are sometimes called the Mandelstam invariants. Okay, but that's just saying that the amplitudes only depend on these uh, dot products. And we see actually that the ones that show up are these more special combinations that just look like uh, a sum over consecutive uh, momenta. Okay, so let's just uh, keep going and, uh, and, uh, and understand this space a little bit better. Um, how many, uh, what's the size of the kinematic space? Well, we have, um, uh, we have uh, n choose two pi dot pj's, but we also have momentum conservation, the sum of pi equals zero. And so if I dot this uh, into pj, it tells me the sum of pi dot pj is equal to zero. I, sum of i not equal to j. So remember, I'm imagining the particles are massless here, so all the pi squares are equal to zero. Um, okay, so the actual number of independent invariants is n choose 2 minus n. Okay, so this is nn minus 3 over 2. Okay, so that's how many independent invariants we have. Now, here's a nice fact. Let's, let's uh, think again. Uh, remember, we have an ordering now. So we can draw this picture that we drew once before already. Um, if I have the momenta P1, P2, up to Pn, uh, momentum conservation tells me that they, uh, that they close up into this polygon. And so it's natural to look at the distance between two points here. So if I have a point here I and a point here J, you see that the distance between them, which I'll call Xij, is Pi plus dot 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 plus Pj minus one squared. Okay, so that's kind of nice that the, that the distance between uh, two points on this polygon are exactly the variables that show up in the, uh, are exactly the variables that show up uh, in the amplitudes. Now, how many of these Xij's are there? How many Xij's are there? Well, notice, first of all, that Xi i plus one, which is just the length squared of one of these edges, Xi i plus one is zero. And therefore the number of Xij's is also n choose two, the number, the total number of chords minus n because all of these ones on the outside are zero. So the number of xij's is exactly equal to the number of Mandelstam invariants. Okay, so that's nice. So so we're we're getting a better idea for what the space is. Okay, so so in this theory, so again coming to this canvas. Our variables, what the amplitudes depend on, oops, what the amplitudes depend on, the kinematical space 
is just the space of all x i j. That's it. All of these n choose two minus n x i j with x i i plus one equals zero. Okay, that's that's our space, and uh, so uh, now we have to figure out what kind of question can we ask in the space of the x i j s whose answer will give us the uh, amplitudes in this in this theory. Okay. Um, okay. So that's. Uh, uh, let me do one more thing, and I'll uh, and we'll stop, and I'll take the uh, questions. Um, uh, let's just see. Uh, let's just uh, restrict to tree level for a second. So imagine uh, that, that what's going on inside. Again, we want to know what's happening in here. On the outside, we have this bio joint. We have these scalars. We want to know what's happening inside. And, um, uh, and, and let's say that we know what's happening inside is that secretly we're summing over three Feynman diagrams. Okay. So that's secretly the uh, answer. But uh, let me just translate what this answer looks like in terms of our new variable. Okay, so uh, this has a very, very pretty answer. Let me uh, draw the case of uh, five particle scattering, for example. So how would I represent this diagram? Well, this propagator is P1 plus P2 squared. So who is this? This is X13. See, it's that core, P1 plus P2 squared. So that's X13. And who is this? It's P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared. And that's X14. OK, so you see that this Feynman diagram, the propagators of the Feynman diagram give me these chords that actually triangulate the polygon. The chords don't cross. Crucially, and in fact, there's a very good reason for this. Uh, this picture of the triangulation of the polygon is in fact a dual to the Feynman diagram. And it's dual in the, in the usual sense where you imagine you put a dot in the middle of all the faces of, of this picture, and there's also these dots on the outside here, and you just connect them. Okay, so what you can see is that triangulation of a polygon So triangulations of a polygon of n-gon are just dual to the uh, cubic planar Feynman diagram. And therefore, we can state our final challenge again. So our canvas challenge again, our space is the space of xijs. The answer, the amplitude, is actually the sum over triangulations t of an n-gon, the product of one over the xijs with ij in the triangulation. Okay, so, and now we want to know if we never knew anything about Feynman diagrams, the space time, all that stuff, how could we start from this space and end up with that answer? Okay, so that is our, that is the challenge that we're gonna, we're gonna take up. All right, so now I'm going Mima, to- Mima, Mima, can I ask a question quickly before gonna, you get too yeah, far? No, yeah. I'm not moving on, actually, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just, um, uh, I just wanna stop and now I will go through the, the questions that have come up in the chat. So sorry, let me, okay. let me not go to the, go to the question. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. No. So, um, I have a quick question, which may not be important. But when you count Mandelstam variables, are you including the constraint that comes from being in four dimensions? No. Um, is that no, important? That's a very, very good. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, uh, here, we, we're, we're very much using, the, things are totally dimension agnostic, so we could work in any number of dimensions. In fact, there are no relations 
between the mantle salmon variable. Uh, now, you know that's actually a fact about the actual amplitudes for these theories. They don't know about those uh, relations. Sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah. but yes, it, it, in this story, it's, it's it, it, in fact, this is in a sense a big difference between this story and the story of the amphitohedron. The story of the amphitohedron, the four dimensionality of space time is sort of crucially built in to the nature of the kinematic space that we're talking about. And an and, and important, really important difference is that in the story of amphitohedron, what matters are the individual momenta of the particles or the individual momentum twisters, and you live in four dimensions. Here, what matters are pairs of particles are the invariant built out of dot products of pairs of them, and, uh, and it does not care at all about the dimensionality of the uh, space time. So, so there are rather different kinematical spaces. Uh, the canvases are different, um, which makes it all the more surprising that there is uh, seen some hidden connections between these, uh, uh, these things as well. Again, I will not really talk about the amplitude until potentially at the very, very end. Uh, in the connection with the uh, 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 non perturbative geometries, Rand equals four super Yang mills. For the rest, for much of these lectures, we'll be just sitting in this silly little space of xij's and trying to figure out what we do there to get uh, uh, to get uh, what what questions to ask there to get to get physics out. Now, there's a couple so, of other. Uh, so adding this, yeah. adding a, a, a dimension label doesn't really help you find new structures. No. Well, I mean, it, it, it could very well be that, that uh, in enforcing the condition that things live in four dimensions begins to relate these stories much more concretely to each other. But what I'm talking about here is just the simplest thing. What you literally get from the diagram, you just get these propagators. They don't know how many dimensions you're in, and that's all we're talking about. Okay? Thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. Some other questions. Um, um, uh, some people asked about uh, uh, in interplay between this approach and integrability. Uh, yes, um, uh, in the story of the uh, epithedron, in fact, uh, one, one thing that that geometry makes completely manifest is this Yangian symmetry. Um, uh, trying to actually connect it to the classic ways of thinking about integrability is it, there's some work that's starting to go in that uh, direction. Um, although it's not there, uh, it's it, it, it has not made uh, it has not made perfect contact. But there must be some contact because, um, it, it, in in a sense, that that's the one of the purposes of light from the amphitheater is to make the the Yangian symmetry so totally obvious that you don't even care about it. Um, uh, but it's just very manifestly there in 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 your face. Uh, again, unlike unlike from the Lagrangian, where it's totally unobvious. Um, uh, someone asked whether we can find positive geometries in the standard model uh, Lagrangian. Well, um, uh, you don't see any of these structures from the Lagrangian, but you see them in the answer. And as I said, uh, just the even at tree level, forget about loops, fancy loops and stuff like that. Just at tree level, the tree level scattering of gluons, when protons bang into each other, cosmic ray protons bang into protons in the upper atmosphere, or the LHC, Whenever those gluons are banging into each other, they're seeing these structures. They're seeing exactly the physics and, and mathematics that we're talking about. So it's sitting there in good old fashioned gauge theory. And it's, it's, it would sit there if you cared about Higgs Higgs scattering um, uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the cubic interaction of the uh, Higgs. Um, so uh, another question is what goes wrong if you just use ordinary adjoint scalars with a trace phi cubed interaction? You wouldn't have the same, uh, you would not have the same color structure. So you would not be able to sort of pull off exactly the same um, uh, uh, notion of uh, planarity. Uh, now I should say that uh, a lot of these ideas that I'm, uh, I'm talking about today, uh, uh, especially when we understand their relationship, uh, when we understand them a little more deeply, they're not so crucially tied to planarity. Um, they do seem to need some kind of color and some notion of ordering, but being strictly planar does not seem to be uh, crucial. But anyway, I'll be focusing on these uh, simplest uh, cases of the planar interaction just because it's easiest to uh, talk about. Um, and um, and uh, yes, another person asked whether uh, whether the um, uh, whether the story of the triangulations being the same as um, uh, as Feynman diagrams is totally general. Yes, that that that's totally general. Any triangulation of an n-gon by by drawing the sort of standard dual picture it is just a cubic uh, graph. You can go back and forth to uh, each other. And yes, finally, someone was reiterated uh, Rich's question. Um, these constraints, there are constraints on momenta, um, on dot product of momenta that come from the fact that, that the momenta live in finite number of dimensions. So if you have if you have a bunch of momenta, 
uh, they live in D dimensions, if you take the uh, determinant of the dot product of more than uh, D of them, they'll be zero. Uh, so there are these nonlinear conditions on them known as grand determinant conditions. And we're ignoring that here um, because the amplitudes don't know about them. And when you take the scalar theory, the answer you get, even if you compute it in four dimensions, would also give you the answer in seven million dimensions as well. So that's the function that we're uh, talking about. Um, the spin of the particles changes things in an interesting way. So we have a question about, um, we have a geometry associated with gluons. We have, uh, we have one kind of geometry associated with gluons. We have a different at the moment kind of geometry uh, associated with, um, we have a different kind of geometry associated with uh, scalars. Uh, uh, the connection of the, from these geometries and the scattering of gravitons is, a, is an interesting and sort of open one um, that, uh, that uh, and I think it's one of the sort of deepest open problems in the subject is that, um, is that th there seems to be lots of uh, uh, deep connections between the scattering of particles that have some kind of color with these sort of geometric positive geometry sort of ideas. But in order to go from there to things that look uncolored, like gravity, at the moment, every approach we know of, be it string theory, field theory, every approach we know of, goes roughly along the lines of something that's not intrinsically gravitational. It's that gravity is like gauge squared, as one of the slogans. Um, but uh, I believe very strongly that gravity is much, 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 much bigger than gauge squared. Um, and that uh, the fact that that's the only way we have so far of uh, describing it is, some, is, is, is a weakness of ours. There should be some more intrinsic way of describing gravity, but it's really one of the big open problems in the subject to figure out uh, uh, how to do that. Okay. Okay, so um, should we take a little break and then uh, come back in five minutes? Is that okay, Nasya? Yes, perfect. So five okay. minutes? Yeah. Uh, 11, what, 25? Yeah, let's do 11, 25. Okay, yeah. is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Right. I'll leave it on. I mean, it's going to be on. Right. So if people want right. to chat, just, yeah. Right. Awesome. Perfect. All uh -huh. right. I'm just going to grab, grab a coffee. I'll be right, right back. Yeah, let's make it 11.25.